Well, this is the third of a series of uh, talks uh, about the science of cavernoma. Uh, there's, uh, it's going to continue every month on the third Thursday, most of this of every month. And uh, before we start, uh, I'm just going to put the disclaimer up that we're supposed to read, but I thought I'd put it on a slide. So this is a science webinar, one of a series from Cavernoma Alliance. It's going to be recorded, and, uh, I'm, and that part of the talk that I've prepared will be placed on YouTube eventually. Uh, there's a slide that says end, which defines the end of that. Now, I welcome questions at any stage, and there will be time for questions after the talk as well. You can ask questions in two ways, by speaking, unmute yourself, and, uh, or you can put them into the chat line, and Pat, uh, my wife, who's here, will be monitoring those, and if you put something on the chat line, she will read it out so that it won't be known that it's you. Now, uh, the views expressed by me, by you, uh, are our own. They don't necessarily reflect the views of Cavernoma Alliance, or, and they certainly don't uh, uh, necessarily reflect current clinical advice. I'm not a clinician. Nothing I say, you, you shouldn't take anything I say as being anything to do with clinical advice and you should seek anything about that from your own clinician. And some of the things I should be talking about today, uh, as it were, have a clinical relevance. But apart from one slide, nothing I say should be taken further evidence about how you should deal with your own diet. Now there's a feedback uh, form, and I've put that onto the chat line, uh, and it would be very helpful to us if you were prepared to feed, uh, to do that. You, you put that into your uh, into your uh, browser and it will come up with a short feedback form. It will take less than five minutes to complete and when you press return uh, we get it in a, somewhere in, in the system. And if you wish to you can contact me. My name's David. And my email address is david at cavernoma.org.uk. So off to the talk. Especially if I can get it to... Good. Now this talk is more has got some science uh, sort of concepts in it, as well as uh, the science we're going to talk about. And the great thing about science is that it's unpredictable. And uh, if you do the sort of basic research that I used to do, then things turn up that are totally unexpected. You think you know what's going on, and all of a sudden something happens and you no longer have any idea about what the cause is. And today's uh, seminar, webinar, started with such a finding. This was found in the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and a lab there run by somebody called Mark Kahn worked on mice because when you're going to work on the biology of cavernoma, you, don't, you can't work on live humans, uh, and, but you do work on live mice and certain breeds of mice are susceptible to cavernoma. And Mark had uh, a laboratory and he had a breed of mice that had cavernoma nicely. And then he had to move laboratory to another uh, nearby laboratory in another building and the mice no longer generated cavernoma. They were the same mice, they were fed on the same diet. It was a total mystery. Uh, the great thing about this lab here was that it was only about 100 yards from where I first met Pat. So that was the, uh, that was the odd finding. What in the hell was going on? And that's what uh, led to a whole area a whole of, of science. Now, the, this area uh, turns out to be one which links the gut, the small and large intestine down here, uh, to the brain where the cavernoma form. And so the link between uh, the two is the bloodstream because the blood that uh, is, uh, goes through your gut goes back up to the heart and then some of it will eventually get through to the brain. So that is the link that is going to be uh, the essence of this talk here. And in that link, the uh, issue concerns the bacteria in your gut. Now, your gut is full of bacteria and other microbes, but by far the bulk of them are bacteria. And that content is called the microbiome. The microbiome is all the microbes in your gut. There are about 100 trillion bacteria there. That doesn't really mean much to me, 100 trillion, but it's rather more than all the other cells in your or human cells put together. And in there are about, well, there are, there are over a thousand different species of bacteria. And everyone's mix of species is different. 
Uh, some of them are fairly similar, but, every, but they're all different. You have your own individual mix of species. If you count up what proportion of number one, two, three, up to a thousand you have, it would be different from what I have or Pat has or anybody else. Now, what I'm going to do is show two slides, which are what I might call backstory, because they're the things I talked about in the first two webinars that you need in order to understand this one. So two slides only that give you the background needed for this one. And we start off with the blood capillaries in the brain. And we start there because cavernoma form in the blood capillaries. Here is a blood capillary without a cavernoma. And uh, we can think of this as being one of the 99.9 .9 plus percent of people who don't get cavernoma. The cells here, delineated by the black lines, are joined together tightly. They have what are called tight junctions between them. And those tight junctions prevent red blood cells and other constituents of the blood getting out into the brain, which is outside here. Food, nutrition, oxygen, and so on, they pass through these cells uh, because the, that, that's what the cells are adapted for. But otherwise, they are tight junctions. But if you're one of the less than 0.1% of people with a cavernoma, where you have that cavernoma, the junctions are no longer tight, they are loose. And then you can get leakage of blood vessels from the inside of the blood capillary outside into the brain, which is out here. So the critical difference between the blood capillary cell walls is that the junctions are tight if you don't have cavernoma and where you have a cavernoma they're loose and leaky. And down here, uh, I've got this thing in the way, put it up somewhere else. This is a picture of the, of the cross section here and there are two cells here in the cell wall, one and two I've marked there. And uh, the, uh, the, the part of the slide, of this first slide, shows what happens if you are one of the 99.9%. .9%. The genes you have are then what are, I've called tight junction genes. Genes code for proteins, and so the three proteins form from the three genes you have that are uh, linked to cavernoma form protein C1, C2, and C3. This is a protein complex. And when this co protein complex is like it is in the normal state, it links through to a protein which holds the cells tightly together, allowing the tight jun junction to be, to be there. So that's the 99.9% .9 of the population. On the other hand, if you have a cavernoma, then you have what are, I'm calling the CCN genes, the three CCN genes active, you no longer form a complex, and that makes this junction lose its tightness. These molecules no longer bind together, and blood can pass through from the bloodstream inside the cavernoma, inside the blood capillary, down through to outside in the brain. And that's where we left the talk at the end of the last talk. But I did say that an important thing an important molecule that uh, is on this diagram, but I didn't talk about last time, but I am going to talk about this time, is a receptor molecule in the cell wall between the blood and this uh, vessel. Receptors are proteins, and they always have a bit outside the cell and a bit inside the cell. They span the cell wall. The bit outside will bind to something in the blood, so something in the blood will attach to the receptor outside and cause the bit of the receptor inside to change. And that means that things in the blood can interact with the inside of the cell without actually having to pass across. So you get a linkage across this receptor, and quite a lot of this talk is going to be about that. So back to the talk proper, that was the background. So we start off with the gut again. Here is the gut, uh, and uh, I've drawn it just as it was before. And uh, here are the, uh, this is a picture of some of the bacteria in this gut. And uh, as I say, it's full, of, it's full of them, masses of them. And what I've drawn here is a part of the lining of the gut. So the inside of the gut is up here. The lining of the gut is these cells that have got little sort of finger processes processes up leading into the gut. And this is the cell wall 
of the, the, the lining rather, of the, of the gut, the small or the large intestine, and then here is a blood vessel that is going to go back up to the heart in due course. And in this picture, the gut is leaky. You can see there's a gap between the cells that line the cell wall and the bacteria are leaking out. But in, the, in, in what I would call the 99.9% .9 of the population, there's no such gap. And indeed, there's a layer that is, I haven't put on here, but at this level here, of what is called mucus. Mucus is uh, as a lining of, this, of the wall of the gut, which prevents bacteria and other uh, things leaking out. So you've got a double barrier. barrier. These cells of the, cell, of, of the wall of the gut uh, and the mucus layer not indicated here. Now the bacteria are, uh, I said, there's about a thousand plus different uh, species of bacteria forming loosely into two big groups, gram-negative bacteria, and they are what the GNB stands for, gram-negative bacteria, and gram-positive bacteria, and this story is about gram-negative bacteria. Here's a picture, schematic, of one of these bacteria. It's got flagellae, enabling it to swim around. These uh, sort of waft in the, in the fluid in the, in the gut and the things can move around. And here is a small part of the cell wall of this bacteria, which I've enlarged up to here. All cell walls in all cells, well, almost all cells, have two layers of lipid, uh, lipid being fatty a layer, as it were, pointing upwards and a layer pointing downwards. And so this is the cell wall, and it prevents watery things crossing uh, across there. And in gram-negative bacteria, there is bound into the cell wall this molecule here, which is known as a lipopolysaccharide. I'm going to put that down there again. And the lipopolysaccharide, Uh, has uh, a lipid part, the lipo. It has many sugar elements, these hexa hexagons here. So it's a, 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 a lipid, many sugar uh, molecule. And the bit inside is the lipid, which binds it into the cell wall. And the bit outside is made up of what are called monosaccharides. Each of these is a monosaccharide. There are several hundred different monosaccharides. So I've drawn different colors. I could have made it more colorful if I'd wanted. Uh, and so this polysaccharide has got six red identical units up here. And this polysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide, is as, as it were like hairs on the outside of the bacteria. Now, I'm going back to the diagram here because the, uh, and I've drawn the same picture as I had before, but I've drawn the receptor differently and more realistically. And the cell, the, the receptor that matters for this story is called a TLR4 receptor. It stands for toll-like receptor, don't worry about it. But there are many TLR receptors going from one up to 13. And each of those receptors binds a different particular kind of molecule. There are many other receptors, not just toll receptors, uh, but uh, toll receptors are ubiquitous throughout the body. Almost all cells in your body have a TLR4 receptor. And CLR4 receptors bind lipopolysaccharides. So there's an immediate link between what is happening in the gut, your gram-negative bacteria with, a, with, a, uh, with, gram, with, with lipopolysaccharides on their surface, and a lipopolysaccharide receptor in the, in, in, uh, on the cell wall of the capillary cells in your brain. And so this story obviously relates to those receptors. Now there's an extra step in this process from what I talked about last week, and that's a critical extra step. Because what happens is that if you have cavernoma genes, you don't form a complex. And what I showed last time was that in that case, this tight junction was lost. But the answer is, it's not lost immediately uh, when you get, uh, when you have cavernoma genes and no complex there's a situation that occurs where you maintain the tight junction even though you've lost the complex here. And that changes when the TLR4 receptor binds the lipopolysaccharide. 
I've drawn these as the little sort of red bacteria, think of hairs, lipoprosaccharide on the surface, and I've drawn that as binding to the toll like receptor. It's not known that that's the case, rather than the lipopolysaccharide being sheared off the bacteria and binding indirectly. But uh, that's an unknown. We're not going to worry about it. When you have the gram negative bacteria with the lipopolysaccharide, you then change the structure on the outside of the receptor, and that changes the structure on the inside. Here I've drawn it square. This is all schematic. Actually, the receptors do look vaguely like this. Uh, uh, but then when you bind the lipopolysaccharide, excuse me, then what happens is the structure inside is changed and that then leads to something happening in the cell to cause there to be a loss of the type junction fiddle. Uh, there's supposed to be a red, uh, a, a red line coming up here of blood and you now have the creation of cavernoma. In other words, there's an extra step involved between the cavernoma genes creating no complex, making a cavernoma possible. You don't get a cavernoma unless that happens. But there's an extra step which is required before you get the loss of the tight junction and the cavernoma formation. Now, I've put a question mark here, and this is the second question mark about science, because this is all very recent work. The first paper that showed the mice in the new blood, uh, in, in, in the new uh, mouse colony, not forming cavernoma was in 2017. And some of what I'm talking about here is a paper that only came out in May 2020. And there's another paper I haven't referred to, which has got a list of unanswered questions. And one of the answered questions, unanswered questions is this question mark, what happens here? It's not all a blank, actually. What I've drawn here is a black arrow, which we don't know the end result of. But one of these, these black uh, rectangles here are molecules. And there is one molecule that's known really, very really clearly, whose uh, concentration is modulated when you get this receptor here. And it's known as a kinase. Don't worry about what a kinase is particularly, but it's a common type of molecule inside a cell, which is a regulatory kind of protein capable of changing things. And so that's the situation we have. We have uh, what is known as a, a third hit required. Hits one and two were to do with the genes. I talked about those last week. But the third hit is something that happens when the toll-like receptor binds lipopolysaccharide. And only when that happens do you get, uh, do you get the cavernoma formation. David, can I ask a question? Yes. We have a questioner that's saying, is the mechanics of this process the same if you have a sporadic versus a familial cavernoma? It is, and that's the next slide, or maybe it's the next but one slide. But the mechanics is the same whether you have uh, a, a familial cavernoma, whether you have a sporadic cavernoma, whether you have a symptomatic cavernoma or an asymptomatic cavernoma, this applies to all those situations. If you have an asymptomatic cavernoma, the, uh, the, uh, the loss of blood is, is, is less. You don't get the large uh, intracellular hemorrhages, which are characteristic of symptomatic cavernoma. But this slide is true of all types of cavernoma. And can I just interject? I don't know, maybe you said it, but I mean, from your other webinar, um, you explained that all forms of cavernoma have a ge this genetic genes component, whether it's inherited or mutated. Yes? Thank you very much. That's quite right. Uh, whether you have familial or sporadic cavernoma, you have to have the, these cavernoma genes in order for there not to be a complex. And you change from having tight junction genes to cavernoma genes, the, the different form of gene, with what is called, what we'll call today is called a hit. The first two hits are on those genes. This, what's happening here, is the third hit. So we have to come back to leakiness in the gut. And so this is this picture of a gut again, because what is critical to the formation of cavernoma is whether the gut becomes leaky or not. And as far as this talk is concerned, there are two factors which increase the risk of the gut becoming leaky. 
I think I might have drawn them the other way around, but the first is having emulsifiers uh, in, in food, and that increases the risk that you will get a leaky gut. Emulsifiers, you're probably familiar with, Sona will certainly be familiar with, with her cookery. They are additives that enable an oily part of the food you, uh, ingredients and a water ingredients to mix, and they're often added to processed foods. If you have emulsifiers in the gut, then they, whoops, a daisy, excuse me, they uh, affect the mucus layer. I'm sorry, I didn't draw the mucus layer here, but the mucus layer is here, and emulsifiers damage the mucus layer, and so any tendency to leakiness will be enhanced. And so uh, that, is, that is bad news for cavernoma. The second, uh, and perhaps in a sense more interesting, uh, risk of gut leakiness is one of the cavernoma genes uh, and it's the third gene the ccn3 gene uh, at, and this concerns people with familial cavernoma because uh, the genes the cavernoma genes uh, whether they are the mutant or the normal form are present in almost all the cells in your body they have the effect of creating cavernoma if they're in the blood capillary cells but they have other effects in other cells Normally they act together so that you get that complex that was yellow, C1, C2, C3. But in the gut, uh, the, in, these, uh, in these cells here uh, that line the wall of the gut, which release the mucus, so these cells here are responsible for the production of mucus that sits above them. That production of mucus is inhibited if you have the CCM3 type of gene acting by itself. It doesn't work with the other two cavernoma genes, CCM1 and CCM2, it acts by itself. And CCM3, the mutant form, reduces the amount of mucus you get here. And when that happens, then you get a tendency to get a leaky gut. And that's important because people with familial CCM3 get worse cavernoma earlier than do people with CCM1 and CCM2. And the reason why has got nothing to do with what's happening in the blood capillaries in the brain. It has everything to do with what is happening down in the gut. So that, David, sorry. Please go. Can I just ask a question taking one step back? Uh, another questioner. Uh, does this, and I guess it means the leakiness, happen with the septicemia or just free polysaccharides? The, uh, I can't answer that question. Uh, I, I know why it's being asked because of the septicemia link, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, apologies. Uh, I, I, I'll move on. I, I can't answer Angio Reliance have produced a CCM Healthy Cookbook, which you can get from the uh, Angio Reliance uh, website. It's produced menus from members, maybe even some of people here, uh, and it's largely due to, uh, cook, uh, to, to meals that have low levels of emulsifier. They're actually producing a second healthy cookbook, mm -hmm. and if you wish to add your own memories to that, then you go to the Angio Reliance website, look up cookbook, and add your menu to it. Then the second thing I want to, aspect of this I want to talk about uh, concerns the mix of species that uh, 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 you have in your gut. I talked earlier, if you remember, about there being a thousand different species of bacteria and everyone's mix being different. Well, everyone's mix is, being, is different, but there are characteristics uh, of uh, different, different people's mix and one fascinating characteristic mix is that the people with cavernoma have a distinct mix of uh, a set of those bacteria from people without cavernoma. And what is truly staggering to me is that that doesn't matter whether you, which form of cavernoma you have, whether you have familial cavernoma, maybe with many uh, cavernomas or sporadic, whether you have symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, each of those produces the same characteristic set of species. As I say, it's not identical because people are different. 
And it's not at the level yet, which we hope it will be in due course, where if you think you might have a cavernoma, instead of running along to hospital and having an MRI scan, you can give a stool sample to a laboratory and they will tell you whether it's likely that you have a cavernoma or not, simply from the mix of bacteria in your feces. We're not at that stage yet. Uh, it's, not that, uh, it's not that reliable. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a test being developed which not only looks at your feces, but looks also at your blood uh, samples as well, because there are characteristic differences in your blood, but that's the subject of another talk. Now, what I said was that there's a characteristic difference between people with cavernoma and people without cavernoma. But that was only a subset of the bacteria that give that characteristic mix. Within the people who have a cavernoma, a different set of bacteria can distinguish between people with familial and people uh, and with the different types. That is at a much less advanced state than the one that distinguishes people with cavernoma from not, but nonetheless, that's a very exciting development as well. So what we have here is the prospect of what is called a biomarker, which can give you information about your cavernoma state simply uh, from your gut content. Now that's the end 